We're going to be seated in just a moment, but before we do, I want us to continue standing as we honor the reading of God's Word today. We are in our final part of this series, Mindset Masterclass, right? We've been studying for seven weeks now. Uh, uh, today will be week seven. We've been studying about how we can renew our mind, how we can transform the way we think, and in doing so, transform who we are. This is the way that the Apostle Paul phrases it. We, we may have this uh, set of verses memorized by now. We've been looking at this every single week, but this is what it says in Romans 12, verses one and two. Paul writes, and so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. That's exactly where we're gonna be today as we study God's word. We've, we've been looking at a bunch of different topics and how we can renew our mind in each one of those. And today, we're going to renew our mind and change the way we think about God's will, about God's will in our life. Are you guys ready to study God's word? All right, all right, let's, let's pray real quick and then we'll hop in. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this moment. We thank you for meeting us in this moment. God, we are an expectant people. We know you're here and we know you're gonna to speak to us. We know that you're gonna move in our hearts and in our minds and you're going to change things today. We know that because God, every time you enter the room, things change. Every time you enter a situation, things change. And so we're believing that today. God, we wanna be different people than we walked in here this afternoon. So send your spirit to do what it does, to work in our hearts and our minds as we hear your word today, that we would hear anew, that we would hear it with fresh eyes and fresh hearts and fresh ears, that what we would learn today wouldn't just be knowledge that we heard some February back in 2023, but that today would be a life-changing encounter with you that would change the way we think about your will for us. Thank you for meeting us in this moment, God. We love you so much, and we lift all this up in your name. And everybody said together, Amen, amen. You can go ahead and grab a seat. Why don't you tell the person next to you as you do, it's good to see you. Good to see you. You can tell them better to be seen than viewed, amen. Better be seen than viewed, amen, amen, right? <laughs> uh, I am so happy you guys are here. Happy to uh, see everybody today. Welcome to church. Can we also just real quick just uh, welcome in the people watching online today? We... We actually have a pretty sizable uh, online community that watches with us, which is an awesome thing. We're so thankful that you are watching and uh, worshiping with us today as well. Like I said, we're at the end of a road today. We're at the end of a road. We are uh, in part seven of the series, Mindset Masterclass. I hope it's been helpful to you. I hope that uh, God's been speaking to you through it. I know personally I've grown from it as I've prepared these sermons. God's been doing something in my heart, and I hope the same has happened with you uh, we've, we've, man, we've charted a long course to get to today. We've been a lot of places looking at a lot of different things, renewing our mind, changing the way we think about a bunch of different topics, uh, just some of them, just to give you a quick rundown. We changed our mind and we looked at things uh, from a different perspective when it comes to pressure in our life, to putting Jesus first in our life, to the true secret, to self-care, uh, to comparison, to discipline in our life. And then last week, we talked about judging uh, so we've hit a bunch of topics, and I want to encourage you, if you've missed any of them and you want to catch up, you can go on our YouTube page, uh, search Cornerstone Church, Akron, Ohio. You can find it on our website, cornerstonechurch.info, uh, but you can catch up with where we are today. And today, we are talking about God's will. If you're a sermon note taker uh, and you want to write it down, our uh, sermon title today is The Way to God's Will, The Way to God's Will. Will. Uh, and as we start today, uh, we did this early on in the series. We're going to use a visual today, a little visual illustration. So, David, could you help me real quick and bring uh, the box, the box and table over? Can we give David a round of applause for helping us out? Vanna White, right, helping us out over here. Uh, sometimes it can help. We, we used a, a visual illustration early on in this series, and I, I think it will help today. It, hopefully, cross our fingers, right? So, I wanna share with you some things first and then we'll kind of explain why I'm even showing you these, right? So first off, 
Has anyone seen one of these bad boys before? Can anyone for the love tell me what this thing is called? <laughs> we, we, what is it? Excuse me? I, I can't, I can't repeat what I just heard. We'll get kicked off Facebook and YouTube. <laughs> Was not expecting that. I, I heard Chatterbox. That's the one I heard. But hey, there, there we go. Um, these little things, and I also, I was incorrect. I guess these things, uh, I, during first service, I was like, yeah, if you were a child of the 80s and the 90s, you know this. And we had some people in the room being like, 80s and 90s? We were using those things in the 60s. What are you talking about? I'm like, oh, my bad, my bad. So these little things, chatter boxes or whatever you want to call them, <laughs> uh, these little things, we would use these in school and, you know, girls especially would use them and, you know, you would like find out who you're going to date and, you know, all this different kind of stuff by picking a number, picking a color. You remember that? You remember doing this? Um, and it was like supposed to help you find your way. Like this is giving you guidance on where you're going. So uh, this is the first thing I wanted to show you. The second thing I wanted to show you, and I'm just going to be completely honest, this might help make my point but this took me a lot of time to make it, so I'm just showing it for that reason. So here we go. I put together uh, the Infinity Gauntlet Lego set. Isn't that slick? Like I said, this illustration, you can take or leave it. I just, I put too much time in to have this just sit in my office. Um, <laughs> but I, I built this. I built the, the Lego set. My wife got it for me for uh, Christmas, and I put it together, and she was telling me, you guys, I was... I was like, man, I wonder if I can get like an extension cord because it has lights in it too. Like it came, you could buy a separate light set and hook it up, do the wiring and everything. With my big fingers, it was a, it was a nightmare, but I got it done. It took, took forever. It's got like 172 steps in the book, right? Just, you know, ridiculous stuff. I had to pull it apart and restart over and over again. And that was just putting the thing together. Then whenever I added in, the lights, my word, it was just, it was a nightmare. But I finally, I finally got it done. It took forever, but I finally got it done. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to show, I couldn't get this little stand to work for a service. Let's see if it works in this one. The last thing is, is this book, The Girl on the Train. Has anyone read this book? Anyone heard of this book? No, no? Okay, The Girl on the Train, it is a mystery. It's a mystery book. I know, I'm like nervous. I need to not bump this table. If, if the gauntlet falls... I fall. I'm just going to be a heap on the ground. Uh, but the girl on the train, it's like a, a mystery book, right? And it takes you all over the place, and you don't really know where you're going until you get to the very end, and then all the pieces come together, and you go, oh, that's, that's what it's been telling me this whole time. That's really what's been going on. Now, why do I have all these things? <laughs> like, what's the point? What's the point besides showing off that I did the Infinity Gauntlet, like, right? Um, I brought these up today as we're talking about God's will because I think these three things highlight common misconceptions that we have regarding God's will. Let me break it down real quick. I believe common misconceptions about God's will is that God's will is cryptic, it's complex, or it's confusing. This is, this is something that I see people fall into as a pastor. I, I've talked with people, I've counseled with people. I know Pastor Brenda has done the same, Pastor Donnie. Um, who feel like, man, God's will, it's, it's cryptic. Like there's, there's little clues and I have to do certain things to figure it out and God just gives me a little piece at a time, a little piece at a time and it's so mysterious, right? It's very mysterious. The Lord works in mysterious ways after all, right? Or God's will is complex. There, there's there's 1,122 pieces to God's will. And if I don't put every single piece exactly where it's supposed to go, if I don't follow everything to a T, it's all gonna be wrong, it's all gonna fall apart, nothing's gonna be right, and it's just destroyed, right? Or God's will is just, it's confusing. <laughs> like I'm reading it and it's intentionally trying to like throw me off the scent. It seems like it's going this way and then it veers over here. And then finally, maybe at some point down the road, it will all connect and it will all make sense, but it is not making sense right now. Misconceptions about God's will is it's cryptic, it's complex, and it's confusing. And what I would say about all of those misconceptions is that uh, uh, we get those from the world. We don't get those from the word. Like the, those, those misconceptions aren't shaped by God's word, they're shaped 
by the world. It's like Paul says in what we just read, uh, Romans 12 2, don't copy the behaviors and the customs of this world. Well, what this world is telling us is this. All these cliches about the, the mysterious way of God and mysterious will of God and we can never really know and it's complex and it's confusing and maybe God will give me a sign. Maybe the fact that this road was closed today was a sign that I'm supposed to go this way. Maybe the fact that that light was out lets me know I should take this job, right? Like we, we think God's will is cryptic and it's complex and it's confusing, but that misconception is shaped by the world. We don't get that from God's word. And what I think is going on here, the reason our enemy wants us to believe that about God's will, that it's cryptic, that it's complex, that it's confusing, the reason I think our enemy wants that is because if it's complex, confusing, cryptic, we give up. We're like, all right, then I'm out. (laughs) Have you ever been to a game night and someone's explaining a new board game you've never played before and you're two minutes in and your eyes are rolling in the back of your head like, please? can we just play like Uno or something, please? Like this is like over my head. I don't wanna have to remember all this. I didn't know there'd be math involved. Like I I wanna have fun, right? And if the enemy can get us to think that about God's will, that it's 172 steps and 1,122 pieces, and it's this confusing thing that maybe at the end you'll get it, but you might have to read through it a few times to connect all the dots, and it's so cryptic and he only gives you little clues here and there, but nothing really substantial. If the enemy can get us to believe that about God's will, then we're like, well, man, how could I ever really know God's will for my life? And we just give up because I can't really know it. Maybe only professional Christians ever get to figure out God's will for their life, but it's never gonna be me. I'm never gonna be able to get where I'm supposed to get. But the opposite is true. God's will is not supposed to be, and it truly is not. It's not complex It's not confusing, it's not cryptic. God's will is clear, it's coherent, and it's certain. That's what God's will is. We can know it, we can know it, every single one of us. That's what we're gonna get into now. I wanna give you what I believe is just a really solid working definition of God's will straight from the pages of scripture. This is what I believe about God's will. God's will is that my passions, intentions, and actions would be formed by him. That my passions, my intentions, and my actions would be formed by him. Let me read to you from Proverbs chapter three, verses five and six. This is my dad's favorite. This was his life verses. Uh, This is what it says in uh, uh, Proverbs three. The writer says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do and he will show you the path to take. You see what's being outlined here. Let's just just break this down real quick. Uh, The first part, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Trust in the Lord with all your emotions. Trust in the Lord with all your feelings, with all your passions, all of the stuff in there. Let God form it. Hand it over to him in faith. Trust God with it. But don't just stop there. Don't just stop at your passions, your intentions as well. Solomon continues, he says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding your own intentions, your own way of thinking about things, your own mindsets, your own strategies, your own vision. Don't trust in those. Hand those over in faith to God. Let him form those as well, and it doesn't stop there. Not just your passions, not just your intentions, but your actions. Verse six, seek his will in all you do. Every action you take, every step you take, every action, let those be formed by God. God's will is that my passions, my intentions, and my actions would be formed by him. You know, the old Mosaic law, the the law that God gave his people had 613 commands in it. It's a lot. It's a pretty substantial legal code, right? 613 commands. It was a lot of this is what you do. This is how you act. This this is what you do, and this is what you do when you don't do what I told you to do. (laughs) Like, there's a whole lot of that uh, in in God's law. Like, this is how you act whenever you've messed up, whenever you've done things wrong. There's just step after step after step kind of feels like this, right? But when Jesus comes, Jesus comes and he fulfills the law. He, He fulfills it. He doesn't abolish it. He fulfills it perfectly in the way that only he could. And he introduces the law of Christ, John 13, 34, and 35, love everyone else as I have loved you. That's how the world will know your disciples. Love everyone that you encounter the way I have loved you. And what Jesus is doing in that moment is he is telling us, he's saying, hey, look, 
I want your passions, your intentions, your actions, everything to be formed by me. I don't wanna just give you a, a list of things to do. I want to form you. I want you to look like me, to think like me, to act like me. Then all this stuff naturally takes care of itself. I want you to be formed by who I am. God actually, there's a, I believe it's in Zechariah. God actually mentions about this day that's coming, that he did have all these laws, but one day he's gonna change things. One day he's going to take his law and write it on people's hearts. One day his law is gonna be so knowable, so forming that people will, they'll just know it. They'll have it inscribed on the tablets of their hearts. That's exactly what Jesus did and that's what he wants. He wants to form the way we think rather than just give us a list of do's and don'ts. If you're a good parent, you know that's what you wanna do with your kids, right? You, you, <laughs> you don't want your 37-year-old still calling you up every single day saying, hey, I need you to make my decisions for me. What do I do? <laughs> give, give me more instructions. Lay, lay this thing out for me. You want to teach your kids when they're young how to think. You, you wanna instill and inculcate values in them and ways of thinking and mindsets so that when they leave your house, they know how to act. They know how to think. They know how to process things. You want to form your children. And let me tell you, God is a way better parent than you. He wants to form us. He wants us to be like Jesus. He wants to form us into the image of Christ. That's why God's will is that my passions, my intentions, and my actions would be formed by him. Notice the distinction there. So what that means and what we see in scripture is that God's will is more internal than it is external. It's more about what's happening on the inside than what I'm doing on the outside, at least first and foremost, right? First and foremost, God is concerned about what's happening on the inside, not so much what's happening on the outside. We need to be formed by Jesus first, which this is the complete opposite of the typical way that we and our culture, even our Christian culture, thinks about God's will. Chances are, if you've ever thought about God's will, what you think is it's like, what's God's will for where I live, for where I move, for who I marry, for who I date, for what job I have, that that's all God's will. All these, what do I do's, what do I do's, where do I go, where do I go, right? That's typically how we think about God's will, which is all external things, all things out here, all things that are action. What is God's will for my life? But what I see in scripture, what I see in Proverbs, what I see all over the place is that God's will, it's not so much the path, like we, we think that it's, it's this path that we take. God's will isn't the path that we take, it's the way I walk it. That's what God's will is. It's, it's the way I walk my path in life. The way that I walk it, that is God's will for my life. One more time, and this is, this is where we see this play out. Proverbs 3, verse six. Seek his will in all you do. Seek his will in all you do and he will show you which path to take. Right there, Solomon is making a clear separation. There is God's will, and there's the path to take. Seek his will, he'll show you the path. We conflate the two and act like God's will is the path. It's not. These are two separate, different things. God's will is not the path. It's the way that I walk it. You see, God's will is not activity first. It's identity first. It, we have got to know who we are in Christ. That is why we need to be formed first before we, we, we go out and try to change the world, right? We need to be changed first. We need God to do a, a stirring and a work in our hearts. Has anyone been seeing what's going on at Asbury University? It, it, incredible, isn't it? Absolutely incredible. They've been having a revival for like the last two weeks. It's nuts. It's, it's wild what's going on down there. Um, and of course, like anything in our world nowadays, it's drawing criticism. It's drawing criticism from all over the place. Actually, that's what gives me the most hope for it is who's criticizing it. <laughs> it's, it's the people who are really far to the right and people who are really far to the left who are like, oh, I don't know about this. I'm like, well, this just solidified my feelings about it because people really far on either side don't seem to like it. And so I, I'm like, yeah, I, I was already feeling good about it. Now I'm in, <laughs> right? Um, what's going on there is absolutely incredible. They've been having a worship service started about two weeks ago. It's still going. It's still going. Uh, people confessing sins, people repenting and turning to God, people uh, just crying out for him in incredible, incredible ways. 
But one of the biggest criticisms, one of the biggest complaints I've seen is people saying, man, this isn't real revival. This was real revival. Where is the action? This is just a long worship service. That's all this is. Where, where is the action? You should be, if true revival's breaking out, you should be going and helping the poor. If true revival's breaking out, you should be leaving and doing this or doing that. You should be taking action. And what I think when I see that is, no, these, this is revival because the people who are going there who are truly embracing what's happening, they're getting it that your identity always becomes before activity. That who you are, who God is forming you to be, has to come before your activity. It has to. You have gotta constantly be going back and reminding yourself about your identity in Christ. Reminding yourself that you're accepted and secure and significant in Jesus. That is so vital. That is, it is the most foundational, foremost thing. If I could have one topic to preach on the rest of my life, that would be it, identity in Christ, because it's that formational and foundational to everything. Because I think about that and I'm like, okay, yeah, going out and doing action, absolutely. Like, of course, of course. But anybody can do those things. Like, I mean, we have charities all over the place that help people who are poor. We have charities all over the place who help people who are down and out, and that's incredible. Amen. I'm thankful that we do. But we have charities all over the place that do that, and they have no connection to Jesus. They have no connection to Jesus. They're just trying to be kind, and they're trying to be moral. And again, that's great. But we are called to be different. We're called to show a love that isn't, well, you know what? Golden rule, do unto others as I would want done to me. No, 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 Jesus upped the bar. It's different now. That's, that's what maybe the rest of the world's playing at. We're playing at a higher level than do unto others as you would have them do unto you. We are playing at do unto others as Jesus has done for you. That should change everything about the way that we serve and we act in the world. So of course we need to go back and remind ourselves of our identity before we have activity. We've got to be constantly reminding ourselves of who we are, of allowing God to form us first and foremost. Identity first, then action. Identity first and then action. So it's not the path, uh, it's not the path that's God's will, right? It's how I walk it. It's knowing who I am in Christ. It's allowing him to form me. And it's how I walk the path that is truly God's will. And since that's true, and follow me on this real quick, since that's true, this is true. You will never follow God's will apart from God's ways. You just won't. You'll never be able to follow God's will apart from God's ways. And here's why. It's very simple. God's will and God's ways are the same thing. They're one and the same. God's will for your life and God's ways, the, the way that he wants you to do things, they are one and the same. In fact, I would wager this ever so humbly. Maybe if you're someone who you're still feeling like you don't know God's will and you've been looking for God's will and you're trying to discern it and you've been in your 20s and you're in your 30s now and you're like, man, I feel like I still, I don't know what God's will for my life is. Or maybe you're an empty nester and you're, I don't know what God's will is for my life now. What I would tell you is maybe you are not knowing God's will because you've not been following in God's ways. Because they are the same thing. Maybe you never thought of it that way. Maybe you never realized that to be true. But God's will and God's ways are the same thing. It's why you will never follow God's will apart from God's way. And you're frustrated because you feel like, God, reveal your will. Show me what to do. But you've never been walking in his way, in His ways. You're like asking for something that you shouldn't be asking for. Because you're not going to get it. It, it reminds me, um, I, I was on Instagram flipping through. Is, has anyone ever tried Skyline Chili before? Anybody? Don't be embarrassed. You can shoot that hand up to the glory of God. Okay, there's the people. I love it. I love it. I know a lot of people are kind of like, you, there's no middle ground. I've never met anybody who's like, eh, it's all right. It's either you love it or you hate it, right? I love it. I think it's fantastic. My dad and mom got me and my brother and sister hooked on it whenever we were little. They lived in Cincinnati during a period of time during the 70s, and so they fell in love with it, and then they you know, got us all hooked on it, and I love it. I love it. So I was flipping on uh, Instagram, saw some guy who's uh, making like the top, uh, uh, the top like 50 most populated cities in the country or something like that, and he's making the top dish from every city. So for Cincinnati, he's making Skyline Chili. 
And he, he gives the rating before, like, you see the whole video play out. So he's like, I uh, tried Skyline Chili. I gave it a four out of 10. Just didn't really like it. At that moment, I almost reported him. I almost reported him for abuse on there. I'm like, this is, no, nah, absolutely not. So he gave it a four out of 10. And then the video starts showing him cook it. And as I'm watching him cook it, he's like making the spice on his own, which is the most important part of the Skyline Chili is the spice. The spice is incredibly unique. And they sell it. They sell like the prepackaged uh, thing of it. And he's not using that. He's like trying to, I don't know, like reverse engineer it. And he's adding in his own things. And then he's trying it. And I'm like, that doesn't even, doesn't even look like Skyline Chili. Like flag on the field. Like, no, this doesn't count. You need, to, you need to try real Skyline Chili. You need to try actual Skyline Chili before you can rate it. Or before you can say that it's not working, that the dish isn't good. Because you're doing it your way. You're not doing it their way. You're, you're, you're making this thing up on your own. Are you following me? Do you see how that's what happens with God's will and his way in our life? We get upset because we look and we're like, man, God's will isn't four out of 10. I, I thought I'd know it by now. I thought I'd have it by now. I thought I'd be here by now. I, I, I thought I would be there. And God's saying, but you're not even, like you're missing it. <laughs> you're doing it your way. You're not even remotely walking in my ways. If you were, you would start to realize my ways are my will. My, my ways, having your, your, your passion, your intentions, and your actions form my me the, that way, that is my will for you. That, that's all that I want. That's all that I want. I want you to be more like Jesus. I want you to be more like him. I want you to be more full of grace and truth, to be more loving, to be more holy, to be more merciful. That's what I've been looking for. We will never follow God's will apart from God's ways. It won't happen. Listen again to Proverbs 3, 5. Uh, it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not depend on your own understanding. As long as you are depending on your own understanding, your own ways, your own ideas and thoughts, you're not gonna find God's will in your life. The way to God's will will always be obstructed because you won't be seeing it for what it actually is. And because that's true, the opposite is also true. And this, is the, this point that we're about to hit on is something that I feel like I could talk on for a long time. I won't, don't worry. We're still gonna get you out on time. But this is something I feel like I could talk about for a really long time because I've, I've known this to be true in my own life and it's, it, it, it liberated me in a lot of ways. Uh, whenever you're doing that, whenever you realize, you know what, God's will is God's ways, and you start walking in his ways, something that I have found to be true in my life is that when I'm living and I'm going through my life, I don't have to go out of my way when I'm walking in God's ways. Like, I don't have to, I don't have to stress about certain things. I don't have to worry about, well, you know, God's will could be X, Y, or Z, and I've really got to stress to make sure that I do those things. I found that, man, you know what? When I'm walking in God's ways, I don't have to go out of my way. And let me illustrate it real quick. This is from the, the life of Jesus. This is early on before he even started his ministry, Matthew chapter three. He's about to be baptized by uh, John. And this is what it says, Matthew chapter three, verses 13 through 17. Then Jesus went from Galilee to the Jordan River to be baptized by John. But John tried to talk him out of it. I am the one who needs to be baptized by you, he said. So why are you coming to me? But Jesus said, it should be done for we must carry out all that God requires. Hold on to that sentence right there. So John agreed to baptize him. After his baptism, as Jesus came up out of the water, the heavens were opened and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and settling on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. Beautiful piece of scripture, right? Love this piece of scripture. But that line right there, but Jesus said, it should be done, for we must carry out all that God requires. That, that line has, uh, it, it can lead us to a certain way of thinking. Almost that Jesus has one of these, <laughs> like a little Lego book, with all that God requires, right? And here's all the things that I need to do and got baptized, check, like <laughs> got that done, right? Um, it can lead us to that kind of thinking because guess what? Jesus, during his time on earth, 33 years, most of these during his ministry, Jesus fulfilled conservative estimates, say 300 plus 
prophecies. Think about that. Old Testament scriptures that point towards Jesus and Jesus and his life fulfilled them. I mean, the statistical probability of that is astronomical. It's, ne it's next to none, right? That anybody could be able to do that. But, but theologians and scholars, they look back and they see what things were outlined in the Old Testament and through the law and through the prophets. And they see that and then they see Jesus living it out and going, wow, he fulfilled this thing. Over 300 of them. I, I don't know about you, if that's me and I'm, I'm trying to just get through a week, I need alarms, I need a calendar, I need lists upon lists. Like, I need all of those things to help me remember what I'm supposed to do. I need one of these things, right? Like, that, that's me. But Jesus, what's so incredible is he's doing this. He's fulfilling 300 plus prophecies, the majority of them fulfilled during a three-year span of his ministry. He fulfills 300 plus prophecies, not on purpose. Like, we, we don't see him in scripture walking up to a situation and being like, all right, let me get the scroll of Isaiah out real quick. What am I supposed to do here again? There we go. Okay, let me go do it. Like, Jesus isn't doing that. He's just living. He's just walking God's way. And we see in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus just does something. He just enters a situation, does the will of his father, and then Matthew will make the comment, this fulfilled the words of the prophet Jeremiah. This fulfilled the words of the prophet Micah. This fulfilled the words of the prophet Isaiah. Jesus is fulfilling all these things, living out God's will. He's fulfilling all these things almost accidentally. Because you see, Jesus was walking in God's ways. Jesus' passions, his intentions, and his actions were in alignment with God. And so all Jesus had to do was live. <laughs> Think about that. All Jesus had to do was just live, just be about his day. And in doing so, he was fulfilling the will of God. In doing so, he was living out his purpose. In doing so, he was making the biggest difference you could possibly make. You don't have to go out of your way when you're walking God's way. You don't have to go out of your way when you're walking God's way. You don't have to uh, you know, worry about, man, am I doing this or am I doing that? When you are honoring God with your passions, with your intentions and with your actions, you're good. You are good. You are right in the sweet spot of God's will. You don't have to worry, well, I don't know. I thought it was more cryptic than that. Isn't there like some little clues that I should be looking for? I thought it was more complex than that. Am I on step 323 or where, where am I? I thought it was more confusing than that. I thought I wouldn't know God's will until a certain point in life. It's not it. When you are walking in the ways of God, you are in the sweet spot of God's will. You can trust that. You can count on that. That is the way scripture says that it is. And here's another thing about God's will. We just got a few more minutes and then we'll close up today. Here's another thing about God's will that's so incredible is whenever you realize that that's true, that God's will is more about how I walk than the path that I walk, when you realize that God's will is more about just living your life, honoring God more than doing a specific thing, when you do when you realize that, when that truth hits, you start to realize, you know what? When I do it all for the glory of God, it's all good. Like, if, if I'm doing everything in my life, if I'm just trying to bring God glory in everything that I do, it's all good. I don't have to be stressed. I don't have to be worried. I don't have to be wondering and trying to decipher codes and all this different stuff. When I do it all for the glory of God. It is all good. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Paul writes this, so whatever you eat, so whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Whatever you do, just do it for the glory of God. Don't worry. Don't stress out. Don't freak out trying to decipher what God is up to and am I supposed to do this or am I supposed to do that and is it this really complex or cryptic thing? When you do it all for the glory of God, it's all good. You see, we have a core value here at Cornerstone called work, workers, not watchers. Uh, we believe that fulfilling God's purpose in our life comes from working on the field, not watching on the sidelines. And so what that basically means is that if you are a follower of Jesus, congratulations, you are in full-time ministry. If you're a follower of Jesus, you're there. There is no such thing as a professional Christian. 
And this is a, you know, something that we can fall into thinking. We see the worship team up here, we're like, oh, they're the professionals. <laughs> like they're, they, they're the ones who've got it together. They're obviously living out God's will for their life. They know what they're supposed to do. And Pastor Jacob, he obviously knows what he's supposed to do. Pastor Brenda, she knows what she's supposed to do. They're obviously living out the will of God because they're the professionals, right? They're the professionals. They're in full-time ministry. But man, whenever you realize that God's will is whatever, as long as you are doing it to the glory of God, it is such a freeing thing and you realize, wow, I can do ministry wherever I'm at. I can be in God's will wherever I'm at. That job that I kind of was like, oh, am I really supposed to be here? That can be God's will for my life. I can be right in the sweet spot of God's will at that job, in that relationship, doing that thing. I can be in God's will. If I see it and I do it, whatever I do, to the glory of God, it's all good. <laughs> it's like, it's all good. I don't have to worry. I don't have to stress. I don't have to freak out. That, that can bring relief to so many people. I know that that's done it for me because that's something I used to stress out about a lot. I remember going to college and stressing over what I was gonna major in because well, what's God's will for my life? What's his will and what do I do? What if I make the wrong decision and I get to the end of the Lego and I've got two pieces left and I'm like, I'm not supposed to have any pieces left. <laughs> like, I've gotta tear this whole thing apart now and completely rebuild it, completely restructure it. That's the way I used to think of things. But then I start reading scripture and I'm realizing, man, how often my thoughts about God's world were formed by the world, not by the word. And I'm looking at what God's word says. And I'm like, wow, his, God's will is whatever. God's will is whatever, that whenever I'm doing it to the glory of God, unless I very specifically felt God telling me to do something, other than that, if I'm doing it to God's glory, I don't have to worry because it's all good. It's all good. When I am walking in the ways of God, whatever I do can be God's will. It can be God's will. Uh, for too long, it's, it's just been for too long, this is what we've seen as God's will. And it has to stop. We, we've, gotta, we've gotta reject this mindset, this mindset that the world has fed us, that culture has fed us, that even Christianity at times has fed us, that God's will is cryptic, it's complex, it's confusing. It is none of those things. It is clear, it is coherent, it is knowable, it is certain. That is the truth about God's will. And when you realize that, whenever you realize that the enemy has been feeding you nothing but lies about God's will, you uncover the greatest truth about God's will, that it will never weigh you down. That this thing that used to seem so confusing and complex and cryptic and so unknowable and so mysterious and man, what in the world? That whenever you are walking in the ways of God and thus fulfilling the will of God, you start to realize, man, this, is, this will never weigh me down. Like this is, it's the most freeing, most joyful experience you'll ever have in life. How Jesus said it, he said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Listen one more time, uh, our last time reading through this, what Paul says in the book of Romans when he's describing God's will. Verse two, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. That's what God's will for your life is. It's not a burden, it's a blessing. It's something that is supposed to bring joy and fulfillment and purpose. And when you start walking it out for yourself, you will see that. You just gotta step into it. You gotta just start walking in the ways of God, start submitting yourself and saying, God, I'm giving you my passions. God, I'm giving you my intentions and my thoughts. God, I'm giving you my actions. And as you do those things, you'll realize, wow, I'm not where I thought the will of God was, but I'm clearly right in the middle of the will of God because of how I'm living, how I'm acting, how I'm thinking, God has transformed my mind about his will. I want that for you. We've experienced that in so many ways as a church. Uh, man, we've been, we've been through some tough times. Like we've, we've gone through some, some hard opposition, some hard things, but what I'm so proud of is that the leadership here, our board of directors, our Pastor Brenda, the, the, the people who have led here at Cornerstone have made decisions that are based on following God's will. And following God's will has never been a, well, do we need to do this or do that? It's always been about, no, what kind of people do we wanna be? We're not making this decision because we wanna keep that building. We wanna do this or do that. We're saying, we want to look like Jesus. 
We want to be Jesus in every situation that we can, and so that's why we're gonna do this. And as we've done that, we have taken some stinking hits, like big ones. <laughs> but I'll tell you this much, we wouldn't go back and reverse a single one of those decisions. We wouldn't go back and undo anything because we know, you know what? We didn't make it because it was a, an activity decision. We made an identity decision. We will never regret an identity decision, ever. Like we, we're making this decision based on who we are supposed to be because that's God's will. And the same can be true in your life. The same can be true. You can live a life with no regrets. You can live a life where you get back, where you're looking back on your life and you're going, man, I, even in those moments I didn't think I was in God's will, I clearly was. Even those times that it may not have looked like I was in God's will because things weren't lining up the way that I thought they should, I was right in the middle of his will because I was letting myself be formed by Jesus. I want that for me, and I want that for you. I'd like to pray with you real quick. Can we bow our heads and pray together? Heavenly Father, whew, man, thank you so much for your will for us, your will that is good and pleasing and perfect. It's not confusing, complex, cryptic. It's knowable, God. We can be certain about your will in our life, and it's really just simple. You just want us. You, just, you want our hearts. You want our minds. You want our actions. And so God, today, we submit them to you. We ask that you would send your Holy Spirit to convict us, to move in us, to, to change the way that we think about your will. So every time we are tempted to start thinking about things from a worldly perspective again, we can be brought back to what your word says about our will, about your will, that, that we can be brought back to that and remember even in moments when we feel depressed or discouraged or thinking like we're, we're missing it, that we can know, hey, you know what? If I'm doing it for the glory of God, it's all good. If I'm following on, uh, in the ways of God, I'm right in the middle of the will of God. Help us to remember that, Father. We can't do it on our own. On our own. We need your help, the help from the Holy Spirit. So send him in full measure, and we'll be sure to give you and you alone all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. We love you so much, and we lift all this up in your name. Amen.